Following the success of Mario 64, Nintendo began preliminary work on a sequel that was rumored to be developed for the 64DD, the disk drive peripheral for the Nintendo 64 that never released outside Japan. With the commercial failure of the disk drive, it looked like progress on Super Mario 64 2, or Mario 128 used interchangeably, was stalled indefinitely. At the time, Shigeru Miyamoto had indicated that Nintendo was exploring two-player gameplay, stating that Luigi was a full part of the game, but they hadn't ironed out every part of the system at that time. Eventually, Miyamoto seemed poised to release the game on a new system, once again touting the multiplayer potential. He then indicated that he had considered four-player simultaneous play, and while no mainline Mario game for the Nintendo 64 or GameCube used this functionality, 2004's Nintendo DS release of Mario 64 did introduce this type of gameplay. Shout out to our first two channel members! Maxis Metal and Spitfire. Thank you, guys. A gameplay demo was released in August of 2000 at Nintendo's Space World event to show the processing power of the upcoming GameCube console, as well as revealing possible new mechanics for an upcoming Mario game. In this demonstration, 128 Mario figures were created on the screen, each moving independently. Because of the success of Mario 64 and the possibilities swirling for what this new iteration of Mario 128 could be, it became one of the most anticipated titles of 2001. Funny enough, elements of that demo would lead to the development of another mainline Mario game in Mario Galaxy, and even fundamental pieces of what would become Pikmin. Man, I love Pikmin. Can we do an episode about Pikmin, please? But it was determined that the tremendous technological expertise would require more preparation for development. In 2002, the creative director considered it a close to impossible task. At this same time, experimental work was going on with another possible Mario successor. This happened to be Super Mario Sunshine, which was officially announced as the new Mario sequel to be released in 2002. You know Yoshiaki Koizumi as the face of the Switch these days. He's the guy who introduces the Nintendo Direct topics with the snap of his fingers. But what you might not know is that his first game as creative director was Super Mario Sunshine, not counting the unreleased Super Mario 128, which he also had a hand in, and he took elements of that game forward into other mainline Mario releases. As a protege of Shigeru Miyamoto, Koizumi tends to draw his ideas from real-life experiences such as hiking, as some of the simplest concepts can lead to some of the greatest mechanical changes. In an interview with Edge in February of 2008, the developer identifies that player experience is at the forefront of the thought process when creating a new game. What an insane concept, prioritizing fun in a product that is primarily made for the purpose of being fun. A lot of devs could learn from that kind of thing these days. As an example, he cites that if you were to take away Mario's jump ability, he couldn't squash Goombas and couldn't break blocks. But the addition of that one mechanic makes a multitude of things achievable. Adding just one new ability to player-based design can open open up a host of new possibilities. Koizumi was with Nintendo for a long while before he was given the chance to sit in the big seat as a game's lead director. He started off as an illustrator working on the manual for The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. While performing this work, he established a lot of the lore that has followed the series throughout the years, including the designs of the three goddesses, Din, Nehru, and Faror. And then, when he was given the opportunity to work on Link's Awakening, he essentially created the entirety of the story along with the conversations you would have with the residents of the island, discussions with the owl and windfish, and even the elements of the boss fights. Koizumi was elevated to an assistant director role when he worked alongside Shigeru Miyamoto on Super Mario 64. It was here that he worked on some of the mechanical components of the game alongside Miyamoto, including one night where he and his mentor mimicked swimming as they imagined Mario would. It might seem so simple now, but back then, then, there was no game in 3D space to compare it to. Koizumi said in a Game Cubicle interview that the GameCube controller was a big factor in why they ended up giving Mario water-based abilities in his follow-up to Mario 64. The firm shoulder button of the controller reminded him of the trigger of a water pistol. Koizumi wanted to reproduce the feelings people had in their childhood of playing with a water gun. The coldness of the water, the mischief of spraying other people or playing in the mud. His first priority was hearkening back to playing like a child would. Thanks to the capabilities of the GameCube's graphics at the time, it was also possible Possible to make it a more cinematic experience. Koizumi also had a background in drama, originally intending on being a movie director. So with that, his skill set certainly helped when it came to bringing a big new game to Nintendo hardware. After some basic water mechanics were conceived, graffiti-like elements spawned from there. Miyamoto acknowledged that there were challenges in drawing graffiti and having it remain in the world, as at the time there were processing limitations that made it hard to disguise the use of such things. The GameCube was able to perform the functionality at the time, but it took some effort from the development team to figure everything out. The water pistol concept also reminded Koizumi of Summer, and from there he came to think about tropical islands. Miyamoto knew that the GameCube could represent water very well, and the idea coalesced into a beautiful island setting from there. 
Koizumi wanted to make a more realistic setting that the team could use to show off what the newer hardware was capable of. Some members of the team even took tropical vacations to get a sense for what kind of experiences to bring back, although they did this at their own expense. Later, in an interview with Game Cubicle, producer Takashi Tezuka claimed Koizumi created Isle Delfino with clay in the shape of a dolphin. Young men, I mean at least younger than me, come up with very interesting and creative ideas. This sprawling city with tall buildings would go on to become the perfect playground for the water pistol's hover ability to really shine. The water pistol concept ended up transforming into Flood, as it was a fun way to expand on the childlike imaginative experience. Wearing a backpack that could make you fly was fun for the team, and they were also able to design something that felt a bit less like a weapon and a bit more like a gadget or toy. Miyamoto indicated that Nintendo R&D made a new system that integrated a 3D engine with other systems. Because of this engine, game development time was drastically reduced. Super Mario Sunshine took only about a year and a half of development before it was ready for release. And they then used that engine for The Legend of Zelda as well. But when you're including the development time of the engine as well, it took much longer. Alongside Yoshiaki Koizumi, a second director, Kenta Usui, oversaw elements of the game. He being frequently known for the level and course design. They were later joined by Futoshi Shirai, who was the map director for the game, and Koichi Hayashida, who was one of the main programmers for the game and eventually went on to design the levels for Super Mario Galaxy, and then to direct several other popular Mario games such as Super Mario Galaxy 2 and Super Mario 3D Land. Mario musical mainstay Koji Kondo returned to compose the music of Super Mario Sunshine and is the person who brought some of the more memorable themes to life, such as the motif for Isle Delfino. He also composed the music for Bianco Hills, Rico Harbor, and Gelato Beach, and his music plays over the ending credits. Kondo was joined by Shinobu Nagata, who at the time went by her maiden name, Shinobu Tanaka. Her musical talents have since been used in various Mario Kart and Animal Crossing games. Super Mario Sunshine also featured arrangements of earlier themes from the Mario games games such as the main stage and underground themes. The game takes place on Isle Delfino, a tropical island inhabited by the Pianta and Noki people, both of which are new to the Mario series. Mario arrives for a vacation with Princess Peach, accompanied by Toadsworth, who also makes his first appearance. The group finds the island covered in a graffiti-like substance, and after receiving the water cannon device Flood, Mario clears the goop only to be falsely accused of vandalism. After being convicted in a court of law by the Pianta people, Mario must clean the island to restore its shine sprites, the source of Isle Delfino's power. Of course, the true vandal is Shadow Mario, who is revealed to be Bowser Jr., yet another character making their first debut and not to be confused with Bowser's younger self, Baby Bowser, or Koopa Kid, which were essentially Bowser's henchmen before Jr. came along to replace them. In fact, Koopa Kid hadn't made an official appearance since Mario Party 7 other than in legacy box art features in newer Mario Party games. Bowser Jr. kidnaps Princess Peach, claiming she's his mother, and then whisks her off to Corona Mountain for a much-needed family vacation. Mario confronts Bowser and Bowser Jr. at the top of the mountain, ultimately defeating them. After the battle, Mario and Peach are reunited and the island's shine gate is restored. Flood, however, is initially damaged and has a fake-out death, but is repaired and the group finally begins their long-awaited vacation. The biggest new gameplay element of Super Mario Sunshine is of course the addition of Flood, the Flash Liquidizer Ultra Dowsing Device. Mario equips this backpack manufactured by E. Gad of Luigi's Mansion fame to clean up Isle Delfino and the worlds that can be reached at its periphery. Mario uses Flood to get rid of toxic sludge and graffiti, to spray enemies, and to perform new feats of aerial prowess. These include things like the new Spin Jump, which helps Mario reach new heights in far-off places, and the ability to slide across slick surfaces. Some variety in its use can be achieved by selection of the nozzles that players can adjust on the pack, two of which must be found by progressing further in the game. There also is a bit of resource management to this game, as Flood can't be used in perpetuity. Perpetuity. Per perpetuity. It has a limit, it can't just be used forever. Big shock there, the water pistol needs water to work, and Mario can refill it by jumping into rivers, the ocean, or fountains, or by picking up water bottle items. There are some courses, however, that take the water pack away from Mario, requiring the players to rely on fine-tuned precision and only utilizing his built-in mechanics. This can be a bit tough, as Flood does become a tool that the players rely rely on for much of the game, and Mario is lacking the long jump that he had in Super Mario 64. He does still have the wall jump though, which the developers believed went a bit underutilized in his previous adventure, so they integrated it into a few more places in Sunshine. Yoshi makes a return appearance here in Super Mario Sunshine as more than just a character you find on the roof of a castle. 
If you bring a Yoshi egg of fruit in order to hatch them, you will be able to use Yoshi's abilities to eat enemies and spray fruit juice in order to clear certain obstacles and even turn enemies into platforms that have varying effects depending on what color Yoshi you're using. Pink platforms move vertically upwards, purple ones move horizontally, and orange platforms don't move at all, all three of which will disappear after a short period of time. And to match the temporary nature of his platforms, Yoshi too does not live in this world for very long, as if you run out of juice or fall in the water, he disappears. And in a game mostly about water, that's a very common thing to happen. Should have picked a better weakness, buddy. What are you made of, tissue paper? A lot of these missions will feel somewhat similar to Mario's previous game, but a good deal of them will also revolve around the new mechanics of the game, requiring him to get rid of the gunk that's shown up thanks to Shadow Mario. Speaking of which, there are a handful of missions where Mario gets up close and personal with his imposter, chasing after him across the levels, though around half of these are related to things he's stolen in Isle Delfino. The game is a bit more linear than Super Mario 64, requiring players to focus only on the mission at hand, with very few exceptions. There's a lot less flexibility in the way that you might discover some of the objectives because of this. There are, however, hidden things to still find in the main plaza at Isle Delfino and the surrounding areas which can be accessed when new items are acquired and techniques are practiced in certain locations. The bosses also feel a lot more fluid and dynamic than in Mario 64, requiring players to puzzle out how to tackle the threat with new techniques. There is evidence suggesting that Super Mario Sunshine once had a planned multiplayer mode, as indicated by the function SMS underscore is multiplayer map in the game's code. When the scene ID is set to 0x0c00, it activates unused multiplayer camera behavior, which can be triggered in the European version with an action replay code. Initially, multiplayer camera control was handled by a class called T Camera Multiplayer, but this was later removed and the functionality was incorporated into the C Polar subcamera class, which includes functions for managing multiplayer camera control. These are programming classes, by the way, like the kind you might instantiate as an object. Yeah, when this mode is activated, the camera zooms out to display both Mario and Shadow Mario, but the camera is quite buggy, often clipping through geometry and offering limited control with the C-Stick. If Shadow Mario is defeated in this mode, he doesn't trigger normal events and instead runs to a node point and stays there, ignoring Mario. So it seems like maybe Shadow Mario was a stand-in for Player 2 in this mode. Fun fact, I don't know how much of this leftover code is used, but there is actually a multiplayer ROM hack of Super Mario Sunshine now where you play play as Mario and Shadow Mario. Aren't modders amazing? There was also this Yoshi nozzle and a sniper nozzle for Flood. Actually, there were going to be a total of 12 nozzles for Flood, if you can believe that. And we have this unused clamshell, which may have been an early entrance to Noki Bay. Though Super Mario Sunshine has become sort of the black sheep of the franchise as far as mainline games go, it had the distinction of being a Nintendo game starring their flagship character. It was critically acclaimed at the time of its release, with Fran Mirabella of IGN praising the controls, the new visual achievements, and wonderful level design. It received perfect scores from magazine imprints like Nintendo Power and GamePro, however, there were definitely some naysayers as well. The game was panned for being difficult, and that was mostly due to slippery camera controls. Some also felt that Yoshi was an oversight, and that the addition of voice acting that was of questionable quality left much to be desired as far as presentation went. GameSpot would even call it the most disappointing GameCube game during the year of its release. Years after its release, though, the game is looked at fondly, with people praising Mario's maneuverability, the quicker controls, and a change of pace when it came to a lot of the biome-based stages that had come to be expected. It also introduced series mainstays like Bowser Jr. and P.D. Piranha. For Mario's 35th anniversary, Nintendo had big plans that weren't exactly a big secret. Following in the footsteps of the wonderful Super Mario All-Stars collection from 1993, Nintendo released a 3D compilation of Mario's first three 3D titles, including Super Mario 64, Super Mario Galaxy, and of course, Super Mario Sunshine. There were some issues with the re-release in this format, though, as the emulation of the game inverted the already tricky camera controls, making things a little less friendly. There were also complaints about frame rates and slowdown, as well as these very strange dev cubes showing up in certain levels that would mark the pathways of certain platforms. Nintendo did allow for GameCube controller support, which made playing Sunshine feel more authentic, but if you were using the Switch controllers, which no longer had analog triggers, you would instead have to rely on two separate buttons to either use a full power spray that would keep Mario stuck in place, allowing you to aim more easily, or the other button that allowed Mario to continue moving and spray at the same time, which was most commonly used during those Shadow Mario chase missions. 
The Limey Lemon made a comment on Reddit that describes some of the problems of the game both in its original form and in its re-release. Super Mario Sunshine gets some good visual enhancements, but its main problems run deeper. I spent a lot of time with this game, and it's sadly a few bug fixes away from being a truly excellent game, but they're fixes it's never likely going to get without a full-blown remake. Another commenter, Mui Gallen, also noted the game's difficulty in a funny way. I've never beaten or played Super Mario Sunshine in depth before. As an adult, I find this game extremely frustrating and difficult. I think Miyamoto was going through a divorce when he made Sunshine because it's so unforgiving. Super Mario Sunburn is one of the earliest full mods for Super Mario Sunshine, releasing with three custom stages, the ability to play multiple missions at once without having to exit a level when you get a shine, and an open world that allowed you to more freely traverse the stages to reach one another. It also included additional coins so that you didn't have to risk playing a mission in a level that might not have had enough to get that hundred coin shine. All these things along with quality of life improvements like more stable camera, restoring the long jump from Super Mario 64, and giving you the option to make the game completable by collecting 70 shines much like it was back in Super Mario 64, Super Mario Sunburn is a real game changer. Super Mario Eclipse, on the other hand, is an enhancement mod that was created by the developers who worked on Sunburn, and it gives players an expanded island that allows them to explore new locations, including four main new levels. There are also new levels that you can unlock later. Isle Delfino has even been slightly redesigned to point you towards all these new locations you can explore. YouTuber Frame Raider describes it as less like a sequel and more like a supercharged deluxe version of Sunshine. Some of the things that make Super Mario Eclipse so great is the return of the long jump and some enhanced flood abilities. It also makes better use of the missile attachment that you were only able to use in one mission in the original game. The mod also has new music that fits the style of Sunshine and blends in with the base game really well. The developer responsible for the music even purchased the same keyboard that was used to compose the music in the original game, and it sounds very much like it was created by people who are very passionate about the series. Super Mario Eclipse uses some creative methods for collecting shines in some of their levels, which makes the game feel like much more than just a revamped version of what it's modding. As is typical in the Mario modding community, some of the bonus levels are pretty challenging, and they'll put a player's platforming skills to the test. There are also some very nice quality of life enhancements that were added to the game, like autosave whenever you make progress and exiting a level whenever you like. Yoshi also doesn't need fruit to hatch anymore, and we've got a green Yoshi here. The green Yoshi is able to swim as long as he doesn't eat any fruit ahead of time. I assume that causes awful cramps and causes him to disintegrate into a million small pieces. There are also some very cool extras you can unlock that we don't want to spoil here, so be sure to check out the mod yourself, especially if you're a big fan of the original game. And very quick narrator's note here, I've heard that some people boot up the mod and think it's not actually working because it looks like base Mario Sunshine. Here's a quick tip, Eclipse has skippable cutscenes, so if that works for you, you have the mod installed correctly, and there is so much content to be found if you just look around. And speaking of the base game, while that didn't give players a huge incentive to get all the shines and 100% the game, Eclipse does a wonderful job of hooking players and giving them more reasons to come back and try to nail every level. And finally, Super Mario Solar Shine is almost a twist of Super Mario Sunshine and Super Mario Galaxy, with one of the developers who worked on Super Mario Eclipse leading up the project. It has the long jump and integrates some of the mechanics of Super Mario Galaxy into Super Mario Sunshine. It's a pretty fun way to stitch together several of Mario's most famous games games. Super Mario Sunshine may have been the black sheep of the Mario family when it originally released in 2002, but with its more recent release as part of Super Mario 3D All-Stars, it's been able to reach new fans who had never had the opportunity to try it, and to grow on those who had maybe been naysayers upon its original release. It's definitely a bit different than some of the other games in the series, with a more relaxed atmosphere, even with the trickier gameplay mechanics. But sometimes, though, a trip to a place that's unexpected makes for a perfect getaway. If you want to see more videos like this or our Sonic development history videos, partner with us in our endeavor to make a development video for every Sonic game by becoming a channel member. And we also have a Patreon if you prefer that approach. Plus, if this video gets a good response, maybe we'll make development videos for all the Mario games too! Bounder tier memberships include shoutouts in the videos, access to our members-only episode library, and stream archive. And if that sounds like a fun time, let me entice you a little bit more by saying we recently did a live stream of Sonic Shuffle, what an abysmal game, where Overbound, Noah Copeland, and myself, Garrulous64, talked about all things Sonic fan games and YouTube, and just had a really great time hanging out and witnessing how actually pathetic 
Sonic Shuffle is, I'm gonna be honest. On top of that, you also get access to the members-only Discord chat with behind-the-scenes looks at upcoming episodes and how we make these episodes. Not to mention, you also get a little badge next to your name in YouTube comments, which help your comments stand out from everyone else's. Please consider becoming a channel member, we could really use your help to keep this stuff going. But without further ado, thank you so much for watching, and this has been a Game Fact Special.